Oh, yep, yep, we got blinkies, okay. Wow, okay, here we go. So, uh, my name is Dave Wyatt, and we're gonna be talking about writing uh, tests for PowerShell code using the Pester module. A um, little bit about me, uh, I'm an ops engineer for DevOps guys. I've been a power, what? I can't be, I, that's the speaker's job. I just taught. <laughs> um, oh, wow, cool, hello. Uh, I've been a PowerShell MVP and done uh, PowerShell.org's board of directors for about a year now, and I've written a pretty fair chunk of the code that's in Pester, which is why people thought I might actually be qualified to come up here and talk. What we'll cover today uh, is really the, the 101 <coughs> content of if you've never looked at the Pester module before, here's what you need to know to be able to go to our DSC hackathon tonight and start to write tests for stuff that has none. Um, so, what, how to write pester tests, how to uh, test things in isolation with mocking, how to deal with weird little scope boundary uh, nonsense when you start to introduce script modules, and if we have some time, uh, we'll talk about how to integrate pester into your delivery pipeline and do some other features uh, that the module has. We'll just kind of see how, how long things go with questions and whatnot. And with that, I'm done with PowerPoint. So. <laughs> Just uh, get my screen over here. That's not useful. That's better. Okay, cool. So hopefully the text size is good. Everybody should be able to see this. And before I can start to, well, stop that. Seriously? Fuck off. <laughs> Yeah, all right, so before we can start to talk about writing pester test code, we need something to test. And so for that, I wrote the most useless function ever. It, uh, it, it really has no purpose other than to have some branches, it calls another function, it calls a couple of PowerShell commandlets, it throws an exception. It does, you know, w b between that, it gives us pretty much everything we need to know to be able to write some test code, so we'll just pretend this is legacy code that is useful, but you're afraid to touch it because it breaks when you sneeze. So this is what a very, very basic pester test script looks like. Um, you can have some initialization code outside, but for the most part, everything in a pester test script has to go inside a describe block. Um, so you have the keyword describe, you give it a name, and then you have a script block which contains the code that runs inside the describe. You can have multiple describes in the script if you like. The script should be, uh, should have a name that ends in .tests.ps1. And in order to run your pester tests, you use the command invoke pester. And by default, that will run just in a console mode where you get some output um, that's nice and green if it worked and red if it blew up. Inside your describe blocks, you can have any number of test cases, which you denote with the keyword it. Um, those of you who have maybe used RSpec in Ruby will recognize the, the syntax. That's what was the, the inspiration for this. But it's, it's meant to be sort of almost like a human readable sentence. So you can read, it returns one when, you know, or do something dash one should be one. So it, you know, it's, it's code, but it's sort of like code that you can read out loud and have it make sense to somebody um, or take from a spec and turn it into this code with, with very little modifications. Inside your test cases, inside your it blocks here, you can have any number of assertions. Um, and assertions in Pester tend to be done with the should command. So you take some piece of data, in this case, I just piped the result of, uh, of do something dash one directly to the should command, but you could also take your results and assign it to a variable and then have a, a little cleaner output. So, you know, I could say actual equals do something dash one, and then I could say um, like that. And then you can even take your, your expected thing, and then you could just have a kind of a boilerplate actual should be expected. And that would work just the same way. Um, so I can, yeah, that's fine. I can run the test script again and it, it's the same, but um, that is the, the bare minimum 
that a, a test script should really need. One thing that you can keep in mind though is that an it block is considered successful if it does not throw a terminating error. Um, and it's considered failed if it does. So what the should command does, in this case should be, just says, are these two values equal? And if they're not, throw an exception. Um, so you don't have to use the, the pester assertions if you don't want to, if they don't quite do what you need. You can have your own function that throws an exception if something is not quite right. Um, and the, the it command will do the same way. So if I were to say, throw, you know, something's wrong, then you would get in your output here, it just says something is wrong, and that's fine. It still counts as a failed test. Uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit more here about what the, the should command does, because it's in, in creating this sort of human readable, you know, out loud, sounds like a sentence syntax, it doesn't look very PowerShell-y. Um, it's, you pass in some number of uh, arguments that are just words. They're not actual parameters with names. Yes? Can you uh, get rid of the throw and change expected to two and see what it looks like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, on the next, uh, the next page, there's going to be a little bit of that as well. Um, but when you use the should command, this is one of the benefits of doing it, is you get some much nicer output here. So it's going to show you uh, the line of your test script where the assertion failed and what the, the code that that line contained. It's going to give you a comparison here. And in fact, if I do, well here, let's, let's just not even go into the code here. If I say, I am a string, should be, I am not a string, I'm a liar, whatever. Um, then you actually get a, a string comparison that shows you the exact character where the difference ended and that the, the links were different and stuff like that. So it's, it's much nicer uh, output when you're reviewing your test results for finding what the, uh, what the problem was. And I've got another slide here that goes more into the same thing. So I had, a, in fact, almost the exact same code um, that shows what that looks like. So here's some of the other things that you can do with the should command. Um, you can have the word not in, as the first thing after should and just negate any other operator. So in this case, the operator I would call B. Um, and so I can say should, you know, true should not be false. And if I were to, true should be false would obviously fail. So um, you can have case sensitive comparisons that should be is not case sensitive. If you want it to be case sensitive, then you use should be exactly and there are other um, operators that have the same, uh, same convention. So there's should match if you want a regular expression, should match exactly if you want it to be case sensitive, things like that. Yes? Okay, the, the question was when is the it block display the, the green output versus the red? That's what I mentioned before is as long as the, the code within the it block does not throw a terminating error, it's green. Um, and the, the assertions, the should command is responsible for throwing terminating errors if something is wrong. Next question. Sure. The invoke pester is mm -hmm. actually calling all the, the PS1 or test.ps1 in that folder. Do you get multiple tests? All in the same folder? Yes, actually, and it even uh, searches for .test.ps1 scripts recursively. So if you run invoke pester and you give it a path, it'll run everything in the whole directory tree. Yeah. Yep. Um, so if, if you've got a module full of, say, DSC resources and you want to test them all, you can just go right to the module root and run invoke pester. So, so the best practice there is to put the test with the script that you're testing from? Mm -hmm. Yep, or in a test subfolder, however you want to do it. I just wondering, is there any way to pass parameters to those scripts if you want to add your Test to have parameters. Can you say invoke pester script with parameters? You can. Uh, it's okay. The, the, the yeah. <laughs> Repeat the question. The question was, can you pass parameters to your test scripts? Um, it is possible. I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll hold off on demonstrating that until we get through all the sure. the critical stuff because the, the syntax is a little bit goofy. Uh, think of it like select object where you can do constructed properties. It's it's a lot like that where you can set up. Um, when it calls a particular test script, you can have a hash table that also includes parameters and arguments to pass to it and stuff like that. Okay. Yes? There's an about should help file. Um, in, in some module, right? It's in the pester module, yes. And there's a pester module, can you get it in the PowerShell gallery? Yes. Yep. Uh, pester is published to uh, the PowerShell get gallery, uh, to chocolatey, and to nuget.org. 
um, and it's also out on GitHub if you just want to go get it directly. Um, all the stuff that we're talking about here is documented in the about should help file within the pester module. So um, it even has some stuff that I'm not going to talk about here because it's hardly ever used. Um, so one thing to, to check for, if you are going to test for null or empty strings, there's a convenient operator for that, be null or empty, because if you tried to just do um, pipe to like should be dollar null or should be an empty string, it, it doesn't always work the way you expect it to. So the, the be null or empty is the way to do that. Should throw is the other big one. Really, I, I would say probably 99% of the assertions that I write in any given pester test are either should be or should throw. And in this case, you're just testing your error conditions. So you're gonna pass in some deliberately bad um, input to make sure that it produces the, the file, or the, the, the terminating error that you're trying to do. Should throw does require terminating errors. So if you're writing code that uh, uses write error, make sure that your test code sets error action preference to stop or, or dash error action stop, that sort of thing. Yes. Yes. Yes, you absolutely have to have the the input to should throw is a script block. So um, you have to make sure to put those curly braces around the command that you want it to run, so that it, it puts it into a try catch to test whether it's uh, it actually produced an exception. Otherwise, you're piping the the output from the command if there was any to should throw, and that doesn't really give you anything useful. So like I said, there, there is that about should help file. There, there are some other operators like should be greater than and uh, should exist for files on disks, things like that. So just uh, check the help file. So. Now what we're getting into is mocking. Um, the, what we've shown so far is actually enough. You could write some complete pester tests if you're testing code that doesn't need to be um, isolated from something else. So. You know, if, if you've got code that normally needs to go out and hit a SQL database or an Active Directory or whatever, and you want to unit test it without having to have a SQL database or an Active Directory, you're going to start to use mocking. But if you're testing, say, a DSC resource on a VM where you're just testing the state of a system, that's all you need. You just you have it, should, and, and describe, and you're done. Um, before I get too far, one thing I can mention is that there's another command that you can use called context, which is just a way of um, sort of subdividing a describe. So it, it works very much like describe, and it actually provides a scope boundary um, for some of the features within Pester that I'll talk about a little bit later, but I just didn't want to leave that off here. So if, if I run this test, you'll see that the, the context gets indented and, uh, and sort of set aside from the rest of it. So with mocking, if we go back and look at our, at our incredibly useful and well-written script here, um, there's a, a line here that is based on get date. And so every time you run this code, you know, if I import this, this script and I run, uh, which one is that, dash two, dash two, whoops. When I learn to type, there we go. It's gonna get a different number every single time. That is useless, I can't test that. So. <coughs> In order to test the code, to, to, to take the output from get date and whatever logic is going on here, I don't know, I made this up when I was drunk. Um, <laughs> it, so I don't know what this does, it's not important, but I, what I wanna do is make sure that it still works. So what I need to do is tell the test code that when it runs get date to return a specific value that I can validate against, and that's what the mock command is for. So over here I tell in my test code, mock get date to return today's date at midnight. Um, and now, uh, that happens to be 1062 as the result of the you know drunk texting equation that I wrote. Um, and so now when I run the test, every single time I run it, it's gonna work. Whereas if I comment out my mock here and let it just run its original code, it's gonna fail. Like, it, I would have to be extremely lucky to get a result of 1062 by, by timing. So. That's what that does. Now, what I want you to, to notice here about mock is that I don't define any parameters in here. I just give it the command name. Whatever parameters the original get date command supports, the mock will automatically inherit those, and that includes dynamic parameters as well. So um, just give it a script block implementation. Uh, you can think of this actually as a process block. What will happen is if you pipe information into a command that you've mocked, it will call 
the mock implementation every time for each uh, item of piped input. Uh, so you don't have to worry about begin process end blocks in here. Just treat this as process and, and let it go. Uh, one thing that you can do with mocks is, depending on how you're using the mock, you can either test the output from it, uh, in this case, so I said do something dash two should be 1062, and that might be enough, but sometimes you actually want to mock something to do nothing. So if you've got a, uh, a destructive command like a remove item or a, a stop computer or whatever, all you want to know is that that command was called, even though it, it doesn't normally produce any output. That's where the assert mock called command comes in. So with this command, you can verify how many times the command ran. Um, by default, it, it, uh, it treats the test as successful if the command was run at least one time. But you can tweak that. So you can say dash times you know, two, if it should be run two or more. If you want it to be exactly this number, so it, by, uh, if, I hit, if it had run two times, this test would fail because I said exactly one time. And there's a scope parameter here, which tells it um, only look for calls to that mock in the it block by the scope it. Uh, by default, the assert mock called command will look in the parent scope of the it. So in this case, it happens to be a describe, but if it was within a context, it would look in the context. And the reason for that is, is backwards compatibility, because that's how Esther originally worked when, uh, when the command was introduced. Uh, so that's, yes? Question? Uh, as far as the, the context block, yes. I have, if I put a mock inside the context, it's only available in that context, like it's not up into the describe. Correct. That's, that's the, uh, the question was, if you put a mock inside a context, it's only active within that block. And yes, that, when I mentioned that the, the context and the describe define a scope boundary for, for pester features, the main one is mocking. So if I stuck, uh, well here, I can just show you, if I stick the mock command up in the context block, my test is gonna to start to fail because by the time it gets to the call to that mock, it's already gone. Um, however, the call history persists. So um, when I call the, the command down here, if, if I put the mock back and it was running, the call history would show up that it ran in the scope it, but it would also be in the scope describe even after, here, let's, let's do this. Um, let's move the whole test block up into the context. Okay, I'm not gonna bother indenting that. So even after we get down here, I'm just gonna do another test point. It works. Oops. Wow. My fingers are nervous. <laughs> so assert, not called, uh, get date times one. All right, this will still work because even though the mock itself is no longer active, the call history happened inside the same describe block and it's still there and still available. Um, now if I said dash scope it, now it would fail because the call, whoops, that's a snippet that I didn't actually want to invoke. The call happened in a different it block and now it fails. So that's sort of how you can tweak the behavior to, to match what your tests are. The nice thing about using scope it, and I do just about every time I use the command really, is that I can change the order of my tests and they're, they're isolated from each other and they don't uh, start to work, you know, because this one ran first and that one ran second. All right, how are we doing for time? 10, 18, okay. Um, so again, this is uh, probably all you need to know to test a PS1 file. Uh, so you can, up at the top of your test script, you can dot source the code to load up all your functions and you can use mocks to isolate those functions if you need to, and you can run all your tests. That's great, except we don't like to publish anything as PS1 files. <laughs> you know, the recommendation is you want to distribute your code as script modules, uh, DSC resources, whatever. Turns out, mocking in particular has some difficulties when uh, script modules are involved, because you mock a command out in your session, but inside the script module, when it goes to resolve that function or that command like get date, uh, it still finds the original command and runs it, uh, which is you know, a little bit of a pain. So Pester has some features to help you deal with that. Uh, so now I've, I've taken my, my awesome function here and put it into a module and renamed it so that the, the stuff that's already in my session doesn't cause things to succeed when they should fail. And over here, my initialization code now makes sure that the uh, the module is loaded only once instead of dot sourcing a file. So now, 
if I run this as is, it's going to fail, uh, as I demonstrated, or as I just mentioned. Oh, did I fix it? How in the bloody hell did that happen? <laughs> Hang on a second. You know what, I'm just gonna restart my PowerShell session here because that wasn't supposed to succeed. Good time for a question. <laughs> I'm not sure I, I understand the question. When do I use assert versus mock? Yeah, or, 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 um, um, yes. Oh, okay. Um, well, you all. The, the question was when do you use mock versus it? Um, you always use it. It is the definition of your test case. What, what mock helps you do is make a test work when it should have failed. Um, so if you've got a command like this code here that calls get date uh, and just happens to return the current date and time, by that code is basically not testable as is. I mean, you might try to somehow get, get date to run at exactly the same tick out in the test code, but forget it. So the, the mock allows you to ensure some consistent uh, behavior there or if you've got a command that needs to interface with some external system or it's going to, you know, format your C drive or whatever, you don't want your test to do that. So you, you stub out the implementation to do nothing. Um, and that's where assert mock cult comes in handy is when you have those destructive commands, you make sure that they would have run if the test was run in earnest, but uh, they don't actually do that stuff to your test system. Next question. Sort of, yeah. Yeah, mock is, is kind of like what if for a test. Uh, at least in that particular uh, usage of it, where you're you're stopping it from formatting your C drive. Um, so hopefully, if I run this now, it should fail. There we go. I don't know why it worked a second ago. I must have had a a copy of get date out in my global scope or something. But um, so th this is the problem. Even though I have a mock here and it worked fine when we were dot sourcing a PS1 script. Because the call to get data is coming from inside a script module, the way the scope boundaries work, it, it didn't uh, work. So there's two ways to deal with this. I'm really only going to demonstrate one of them because it's, it's more reliable. Uh, it's, it's the newer code. There is a command in Pester called in module scope, and you can wrap whatever part of your code in it you want to. I'm going to put it all the way outside the describe. O2 module, you give it the module name. And now everything inside that in module scope block is going to be run inside the scope of the module, even the, the test code. Um, so now when I run this, oh, you've got to be kidding me. Oh, yeah, that's important. Push the button, right? <laughs> there we go. Um, so this is nice. In, in module scope, not only does this allow you to handle the mocking problems, but it also allows you to test the internal code of the module. So it, over here, I've got this non-exported function. If you notice, I only exported the do dash something in module, but I've got this do something else in module. If I comment out my in module scope here, and let's see here. <coughs> I try to call my do something else in module. And what does that do? It returns the system root. Okay, so I'm going to do this and say result equals that. And then I'm going to say result.full name should be in system root. Yep, why not? Let's save. And now when I try to run this, I've, I've commented out my invoke uh, or my, my in module scope. 
it says it, it can't find the command because it's not exported. So that's the other benefit to using in module scope is that you can unit test your internal bits that are not exported without having to jump through any hoops of saving them in another module that does export them, like Don had mentioned with the DSC resources, or putting them into a, a separate PS1 file that you can dot source with this. You can have it all in a, in a single module if that's your, your pleasure, and it should just work. Um, I will mention one little gotcha to be aware of when you're using in module scope. Because this code executes inside the module, be careful with what you name your variables. Um, because if you have, if, if you've got test code that depends on a variable named, let's say, computer name, and then you call a command inside the module that has a parameter named computer name, you're going to be looking at, you know, because of the dynamic scoping of variables, you're going to wind up, your test code's going to look at the parameter value instead of whatever you defined out here in your code. So it might be a good idea to prefix these with, you know, underscores or mock or what, what did I just do? <laughs> My, the, the mouse slides down the podium here and <laughs> continues to do funny things. You know what, I'm just going to turn this off and use my trackpad because that's ridiculous. Um, so, you know, you can, uh, you can call this result or whatever. Um, by the way, ISE steroids, flipping awesome. When you want to rename variables and you just hit F2 and call it whatever you want and it changes it everywhere. We love it. Love ISE steroids. So. Yeah, in module scope, if you're dealing with script modules, as long as you name your variables carefully, you're in good shape. Um, I'm, I may as well go ahead and demonstrate the other one because we've got a few minutes here. Um, so if I come in at the in module scope, now this will not work for testing internals. This is purely something that helps you with mocking across script module modules, script module boundaries. Um, you have there's a module name parameter on the mock command, and there's a corresponding module name command. Uh, parameter on a certain mock called. And there's a lot of, per oh man. All right, ISC steroids is mostly okay. <laughs> Except when there's snippets that I didn't actually intend to use. Um, so now if I run this, it, it should actually be okay. The problem, oh, I'm trying to use the mouse that I turned off. There we go. So thing to keep in mind if you use this approach is one, well, if I uncomment out my uh, test of an internal function, this is still going to fail. And two, you have to make sure to use the dash module name parameter on both your assert mock calls and on your mock commands, because uh, otherwise it, it, you can actually have the same command mocked in two different modules at once. I can't imagine a use case where you'd ever want to do that, but it, it's possible. So you have to tell it where to look for the call history and where to inject the mock. So here we go, we'll, uh, we'll run this again and watch it blow up because it still can't resolve the, the non-exported command. And no, no questions, good. All right. So now we're actually, we're making great time here. It's not even uh, half past. So what I was gonna get into next, if we got through all that stuff in a reasonable amount of time, is this is how you integrate Pester with a continuous delivery uh, pipeline. So say you've got your DSC resources out on GitHub you check some new code into master or a pull request or whatever, you can have, uh, using whatever build server your, you know, your choice is, so you can have App Bayer or Team City or Jenkins or uh, I think Visual Studio has a, a, a thing now. So um, you can have it monitoring your source control and kick off a job that runs Invoke Pester and you can have your build process abort if any of the Pester tests fails. And the way that you do that, this code is basically all the same stuff that we were just talking about with uh, with the module and stuff. Uh, there, are, there are several different ways you can do this depending on what your build server supports. The one that I like the most is to use the pass-through switch on invoke pester. If your build server will run arbitrary PowerShell code and you can do it, then run invoke pester with dash pass-through. Um, I threw quiet on here just to stop uh, spamming my screen at this point because it suppresses the console output. And what you'll get here, I'll run this code I'm still trying to use that mouse. Here, let's just put that away. <laughs> so you get this this object that uh, shows you what the state of the the test runner was. So it shows us that we ran six tests, four passed, two failed. Really, in a build job, for the most part, all you care about is failed count. So we say invoke pester dash pass through if failed count is greater than zero. You know 
page the developer or whatever it is you want to do in your job. Um, if you have, and there's a, there's a lot of other information in here. There's this test result. So if I do result, that test result, this is detailed information about each of the test cases, each of the it blocks that ran. Um, so it shows you what the describing context that were active, what the test name was, um, how long it took to run, all the same stuff that you get at the console output uh, if you're like your failure message in stack trace if you're uh, if you're using the should command for assertions, all that's in there as well. So it's nice if you want to do some more complicated uh, logic there. If you've got a test runner that really only knows about command line executables and doesn't let you run PowerShell code, first of all, get a new test runner. But if you can't, um, you know, I don't even know of any that might still fall into this category, but you can run uh, PowerShell.exe, tell it to run invoke pester with the dash enable exit parameter, and the exit code is going to be the same value as in that failed count. So zero tests failed is good, like command line executable zero is good, and any, uh, any failed tests will give you a non-zero exit code. So this will run, and should show us, uh, really? Or it'll just sit here and screw up my session. All right, that's fine too. <laughs> All right, I don't know why that didn't work. Um, but that was just a start process thing. The exit code will be not, it will match the number of failed tests. And one neat thing you can do in, in conjunction with these other things is uh, Pester has the, the ability to output a file uh, when it's done running the tests. The only format it supports right now is NUnit XML, but it's extendable. We've got this output format uh, parameter that we can tack on new formats as people come up with ideas of how to represent the, the test results. And if you've got a, uh, a build server that already knows how to integrate with NUnit and show you exactly what tests ran and whether they succeeded or failed or whatever, um, you can do the same thing here. And so if we run the tests, you get, you know, I can't read this, but Team City can. So. Um, you know, it's XML, it's ridiculously verbose, and all the information's there. And all right, any, any more questions on that? Yeah, cool, excellent. All right, and that, so now we're gonna get into the cool stuff um, that I didn't know if I was gonna have time to do. So you may have noticed that in the tests that we've written so far, if we go back to our useful and uh, self-documenting function here, I've really only tested three of the branches um, in, in any of the code that we've done so far. Uh, I, I don't think I called this do something else in module and I don't think I called this, uh, this get item yet except in, in demonstrating the, uh, the module internals. So if I go back over here, I'm just gonna make sure that's still, so do something in module. Oh, this one's actually got everything. I'm gonna comment out that test for a moment. Um, one of the important things that you're going to come across when you're writing your test is knowing that you've tested enough. So you've either, you know, maybe you practice test different development and you just don't care about this because you always have 100% coverage, or maybe you're like me and you write a big pile of code and then you groan because you have to go back and write a big pile of tests. Either way, it helps to know kind of where you're at. And Pester has a feature that allows you to analyze your code coverage as the tests run. And the way that you do that is you run invoke Pester dash code coverage, and you just give it the path to the files that you want to analyze. In this case, it's my PSM1 file. So if I say O2 module, it runs the test. It still tells me whether they succeeded or fast, but then at the end, it gives me this nice little thing here that says, you didn't even call these two commands of, your, of the file that we analyzed. So it does this by setting a bunch of breakpoints before the test run, and then after it's done, it checks to see which ones were hit and which ones weren't. Um, little word of caution, just because a line of code ran doesn't mean you actually tested it. So it's not a perfect metric, but it, it's helpful. What I can guarantee you is that I absolutely did not test those two lines of code because they didn't even run. So it, it's helpful. Um, you can try to get your coverage up to whatever threshold you know your organization feels is good, 75, 80, 90%, whatever. Um, if you go for 100%, you're probably kind of masochistic because a lot of your error handling conditions are there to be robust and stuff that'll probably never happen. <laughs> but you can, 
Does yes. that work properly when you have a command that goes across multiple lines with command you know, extensions? Yes, yes. Uh, the, uh, the, the analysis, the way that it works is it uses the AST oh. to, to pull out all the commands that uh, through trial and error we figured out which ones will actually trigger breakpoints and which ones won't. So it's, th there are some things that like if you just have a, a naked return keyword, doesn't trigger a breakpoint. So we don't set a breakpoint on that. Um, but it works. The, the way that, uh, the alternative that we could have done was set a breakpoint on every line with no column. That does work. That'll act like the, the naked return keyword. Any line that gets hit that way will trigger the breakpoint, but it won't handle the case where you've got multiple commands on the, the same line. So like here, if I, if I say I'm, I've got a pipeline and the first command in the pipeline never outputs anything or it throws an exception or whatever, then I, maybe the second line will trigger the breakpoint. I'm not sure. But anyway, this, uh, this seemed to be the more reasonable approach was to analyze the file for what you know should work. So um, what you may find, like if, if I do um, like a string with an embedded sub-expression and stuff, you'll actually get multiple breakpoints for that same line because the inner expression counts as one and the string that's using it and the command that's using the string. And you know, it, it, it might get a little bit, uh, a little bit verbose in the output, but it's still better than nothing. All right. Um, one of the features that I haven't talked about yet, and we've still got a, a few minutes here, the, uh, Pester automatically gives you a test drive. Um, so if you need to do any interaction with the file system, you know, creating files or, um, well, yeah, you have to create them because it's empty by default, but uh, inside your tests, you can refer to either a dollar test drive variable, uh, I'm just gonna make something up here. So you've got test drive. I'm just gonna do that for, for Google so that when we run it. So that gives you the actual path on the file system that it's created for you. You've also got a, a PowerShell drive. So you can do paths of test drive colon slash whatever. Um, and that's actually kind of a nice thing. If you're, if you're testing code that takes uh, file paths as input, a lot of people will, and myself included, will forget that PowerShell paths and what .NET sees as file system paths are very different things. So if you pass in a path of test drive colon slash whatever, and your code is not properly translating that to an actual file system path, your test will blow up. So you just kind of get that for free. Um, the nice thing is that the, the test drive folder on the file system is automatically cleaned up when you get to the end of your describe. So dump whatever you want in there. Don't worry about cleaning it up because Pester will do it for you. That's actually all I, uh, I came here prepared to talk about. And we still got about 10 minutes if anybody, yeah. You've been using a technique to comment out code. Yes. I finally figured out what you're doing, but I don't think other Oh, sure. Um, th this is actually not an ISE steroids thing. The, the, the raw ISE will do this, but if you hit uh, Alt-Shift, you can highlight as though you're out in like a console, so you can take blocks like this, and you can do the same thing. So if I hit Alt-Shift and down arrow to the lines that I want, and then I just hit pound space, it injects that text on all the lines at once. Um, I like it. <laughs> it works. <laughs> Okay, the, the question was, can you take your pester test code and put it in the module itself? I wouldn't recommend it because I'm not sure how you would, I mean, when somebody's using the module in production and not actually intending to run the tests, how are you gonna tell the test code not to run? And plus you're gonna take a dependency on pester, even on the machines that you deploy the module to after it's tested. Um, it's, it's a good idea to package them together, particularly in source control, so that anybody that is gonna come and contribute to your module can make sure that they haven't broken any existing tests or they can contribute new ones, but it should still be in a separate file. Um, now, strictly speaking, I, I could rename this to something that does not end in .test.ps1, um, and if you run invoke pester, there, uh, here, I'll show you a git command.
Well, well, even in C sharp, you don't put the tests and the, the live code in the same file. Um, it's I don't think it's a good idea because <laughs> then the tests are just going to run every time somebody imports the module on the live system, and that's probably not what your intention was. Um, in in Pester here, that you've got this dash script parameter, and it's you know positional, whatever. Of course, it's going to be as confusing as possible and be an object array because you can do those. Uh, oh, in fact, I'll, I'll demonstrate the parameters uh, thing that I mentioned earlier, but. If you give it a path to a file, like a specific file, it doesn't have to end in .test.ps1. That's just when it's searching a directory. So um, there are some use cases for that that we got from, from Microsoft, actually. Um, but here, I'm going to show you very briefly here um, how to pass parameters to a test script. So if I say, parameter there we go so now if I try to run my, my script because this is a mandatory parameter weird things are going to happen it's just going to blow up there we go yeah oh that's that's even worse <laughs> so what you can do is you can run invoke pester dash script and you can say path equals dot uh, one. Wow, this is really going to stink. You know what? Actually, I'm just going to say path equals dot, and it'll still search for the directory. And then I can say parameters and another hash table that's going to get splatted to the scripts that it calls. So in this case, something equals whatever. And nope. I, oh, that's, yeah, there we go. And then it will will run it. So, um, and I could do up here, I could do a right. Uh, I don't know. Let's pick a fun color. Show that last command one more time. You yes. So fast, I can see it. Yep. Um, dash dark gray. You'll just have to hit pause on the video at the right second, right? Um, <laughs> so something here. So we'll write that to the screen. And so the command was invoke pester dash script. And like I said, this is a lot like a constructed property in a, in a select object or a format kind of command where the path is just the, the path to the script or to the directory that you want to search for .test.ps1 files. And then it can take a, a parameters, which is a hash table that's going to be splatted. So in this case, if you want it to run with dash something, string whatever, it looks like that. Uh, you can also, if you're using positional parameters, uh, there is a arguments equals, and then this would be an array instead of a hash table, um, as soon as I can remember how to type one. So that should still work. Are those the only, are those the only values for that object? I don't remember. <laughs> Let's find out. So let's see here. We've got script. It can take, yep, path arguments and parameters. And if I remember correctly, you can also abbreviate them. So it's um, like there's params and A and args and things like that. It's a convenience. But for the most part, just use the full names, because otherwise Jeff Hicks will, will chastise you in a tweet. So at that, it's, uh, it's just about time here. So, oh, another question? For your, is null or empty? How's that handle DB nulls? I don't. Come back from SQL? Yeah, I, I don't know. Off the top of my head, we should test that. The question was, um, does the is null or empty should assertion handle DB nulls? I don't know. I'd have to test it. Um, it. It might be something that we can add to that, if you would like that condition to be handled. Uh, you might be able to do, uh, should be, you know, db null dot value, and it, it might work that way, because then it's just going to do a reference uh, comparison. So. And with that, I think it's about time to push the button. Uh, oh, one thing I'm going to do here before we go is, is put up the, uh, uh, I'm not even going to bother doing presentation view on that, um, the, the link to Pester out on GitHub if you want to contribute or you know look, log issues or pull requests or whatever you want to do and if you want to get in touch with me there's my email address and Twitter handle and you can also you know logging issues on on pester gets my attention pretty fast <laughs> so all right thank you